<laughs> Happy Halloween. For for Halloween, I, I thought we'd talk about something. Probably for most of us, the scariest thing that you do, and it's this view. Right? No one likes to be up on stage. No one likes to give a talk. Very few do. On these surveys that talk about people's phobias, uh, the public speaking is past heights, it's past spiders, it's past death. People would, uh, would, would rather lose a family member or their own life than have to give a talk. And yet, we're all in academic medicine, and a big part of what we have to do all that time is give these talks. And because we're afraid, and because there's no training, So the, so let me start with a little story. The one time I got invited to give a talk, a uh, college talk in Washington, D.C., and, and I thought that it was kind of a low-key, casual, you know, kind of informal talk. And uh, it turns out that this violates one of the rules that we'll talk about, which is know your audience and know your venue. And and I showed up, thought this will be easy, and I walked in, and the audience looked a lot like this. There were 2,000 people in the audience, and they had bolted up on these two giant towers, and they had like big television <coughs> studio cameras, like the ones with the big sticks and the screen and like, you know, a tech behind it, and they're zooming in, and your face is up on a screen, and there's bright Klieg lights, and they, and you have to climb up this ladder to this podium that was up in front of everybody. And right before I went on, they said, now just so you know, this is being broadcast to 65 countries, and there's 5,000 other people watching. <laughs> so I had a moment of despair. <laughs> but it didn't last long, because I had followed the three rules that we're going to talk about today. The first one is I had prepared a lot, especially even on the, on the trip down, I had just buffed my slides, I was ready for the talk. I had really powered my PowerPoint. Everything was tucked in, everything was smooth, and it was ready, and I knew how to present with the boss. So we're going to talk about what this really means today, and this is, this is the talk talk. So when I released this, I, I learned something interesting about, about titles. Because a lot of people, when they saw the announcement, they said, oh, is this a talk about giving bad news? <laughs> uh, I, somebody asked me if this was a talk about the birds and the bees. <laughs> so I, I guess be careful with your title. No, this is a talk about giving talks, right? One of the dirty secrets of training programs, as I often say, is that there's hardly training in training programs. How do we do most of our learning? Work. Well, that's right, but you almost—it's almost all for imitation, right? So, so almost all of us have learned how to give talks from seeing other talks that we gave. Except, are those talks really that inspiring? Often not. And so, let's see what the difference is uh, for how to how to make that difference. All right. First is a preliminary. purpose of a talk is not a book report, right? It's not a book chapter. This is a completely different <coughs> medium than a chapter or a book, so it has a completely different purpose, right? The, we're going to get to what that purpose is, but that extra complete uh, encyclopedic kind of presentation is not what the, what is the First, let's start with this. The purpose of any successful talk, any talk at all, turns out just one thing. What do I mean by that? I mean that all talks really are really about just one theme. It's not even a topic. Uh, it's it, a 
theme is a different idea. A theme has a verb and it informs what you're going to talk about and everything that you include should come back around to this theme. Chris Anderson, the guy who invented TED Talks, calls this a, a through line, but I just call it a jot, right? A jot. So what do we mean by just, just one thing? Well, <coughs> there's plenty of room. Please come in. Please come in. Lots of room. Uh, when you choose a, a just one thing, for your talk, what you're really doing is you're, you're doing a practice of, of cognitive integration. That means that you're taking all kinds of facts, weird things that are not related, relating them to a single idea. So a single idea that then your audience is then, can then generate their own examples of this. Now, what, what do I mean? Uh, <coughs> This is a, this is a, what, what is this? This is a dizzying array of seashells, right? There's, this is just a tiny, tiny fraction of all the different shapes and sizes and colors and textures of seashells that you might find in the ocean. And there's just thousands and thousands of these. Oh. Well, there are, there are scallops here. There are cone shells, deadly poison. There are snails, okay, scallops. There's all kinds of sea scallops. All kinds of mollusks. Tiny sweet bay scallops. And tucker. Oh my god. So it sounds like that guy on Forrest Gump talking about shrimp. <laughs> That's right. So, well, but wait a minute. So, you might say, well, we could integrate these with all mollusks, but it doesn't really help. So what, what's a different way to integrate it? Well, here's a kind of a surprising thing. It turns out that all of these shapes, everything, even this and this and this, are actually all the same shape, except that they just vary on a model that just has seven parameters. That's it. And so that's an example of, of integration. That is saying that all this variety is actually all the same, or it comes across all the same equation, but all the different are the little levers that control different parts of it. And so an act of cognitive integration shows those levers. So what are some other examples of just one thing? Well, here's a really famous one. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. That's, you can see how uh, that's an assertion. This is one of my favorite ones. Nothing in pediatrics makes sense except in the light of allometric scaling. That's a different thought. Just three rules optimize mechanical advantage for any MIS space. The famous wrenching is rarely reflex. And appendicitis is a math problem. You can see how, like for this one, I could have made a, a book report about appendicitis, but instead, this one actually relates to all the kind of different math uh, models that inform how we diagnose and treat appendicitis. That's a just one thing. That's a through line. So what's the just one thing for this talk? It turns out that there are two kinds of talks. There are good talks and bad talks. And what is the difference? What do you think? Any ideas? Separates a really great talk from a bad talk. The audience. Wait, you guys, a, a bunch of you are, are onto it. It's not exactly engagement. You're, you're right, that's, but you're getting it. Do you serve your needs? Or do you serve the needs of the audience? Everything that serves mostly you hurts and degrades your talk. Everything that serves the audience makes your talk a little bit better. Now, wait a minute. What am I talking about? What do I mean serving your needs? I mean serving the kinds of needs that serve your fear or serve your lack of preparation. So for example, if you hide here, maybe you cower a little. You never look at the audience and you just read your slides. 
you're serving your own needs. You don't want to be here. If you can't be bothered to to bring polished slides out, that serves your needs because it's just lazy. Right? On the other hand, if you really took a lot of time on it, uh, then you're there. So here's a perfect example and one of my big pet peeves of serving your own needs and one of the first rules. I don't apologize before performance. You see this all the time, right? So people go, people go, all right, well, uh, you know, thanks for being here. Gosh, you'll have to really bear with me. I didn't really have too much time to prepare. And so my slides are a little bit of a mess. Something like that, right? You've heard like dozens of examples of this. <laughs> See how that serves your needs? Wait, what are you trying to do when you apologize before performance? Lower expectations. You're trying to lower their expectations. You're setting it way low so you can hop over that little bar. Right? Like, uh, <laughs> you're trying to set those expectations really low. All right, so here I'll tell you another story. So, so my dad was a manager at IBM for years and years, and, and these young guys came in and they were going to give a talk, and they started like that. They're like, well, uh, you know, I just kind of bear with me here. I, I'm not quite sure it's this is exactly the preparation presentation I wanted to give. And I goes, all right, and he left. <laughs> and they're like, where are you going? He's like, if you can't be bothered to be ready, I'm not going to bother to listen. So never apologize before a performance. Prepare. How long? Here's a shocking statistic. If you do it right, it takes about one or two hours of preparation for every minute you get a speak. That's crazy. A 50-minute talk takes 50 hours? Yeah, if you do it right. But wait a minute. What counts as preparation time? Not just like sitting there like doing your PowerPoint, but everything. Everything that you've read, everything that you're thinking about, like you're out there for your run and you're like, you know, I'm thinking about my talk. You know what I really should say is this. That counts as preparation time. Like that kind of obsessive working over it. And it turns out that this whole act of creating a talk is, is one of the ways that we actually figure out what we really can do. <coughs> Just like the way we, we we're coming up with a way to speak to people, that's actually putting things in words that helps us figure out what we're really thinking about some topic. Same thing for writing. All right. Strangle your daemon. What's a daemon? What is that? The daemon is that little voice inside, that little spirit inside that says, you're not good enough. <laughs> They're going to judge you. You're incomplete. Sometimes it says, Dr. Adzik's going to spring a joker on me, some trivia that I'm just not going to know, and I'm going to be embarrassed. And so what do you do? What do you do? You listen to the daemon, and you're like, well, I'm going to add some more in there, and I'm going to put some more bullet points in there, and you put more and more and more, and you just cram stuff in there, you cram, it's like, just dump the kitchen sink in there, because you want to be completely, utterly complete at every moment, and you'll have an encyclopedic talk that goes over that no one can listen to boring, right? So you don't want, you don't want to strangle your demon. You want to forget that guy. Remember, what's my just one idea that I want to deliver to the audience? Strangle that guy. And speaking of which, <coughs> don't do what I did and <laughs> mistake who your audience actually is. You've got to figure out who your audience is that you're talking to and what kind of venue it is. Right? If it's something something like this, I can speak in a different way than if it's like one of those giant things where they force you behind a podium. Although even then, you can do interesting things. But you need to plan for this in advance so that you're not caught off guard. And uh, there's even another little side rule of this. Richard Feynman, who's the Nobel Prize winning physicist, wasn't just a great physicist, a great teacher. In part because he knew all about just one thing. He could integrate any, all these disparate concepts into something very understandable, but he always taught up, right? Like, well, the conventional wisdom is like, you know, oh, you know, you want to make sure that you're inclusive and, and bring everybody in and like teach to like sort of the lowest, you know, kind of part of the group. And that, that's not right, actually. 
because you, you actually, if, if your audience is on kind of a curve of, of previous knowledge, you'll fail to serve any of them. Because the ones that are already advanced in the subject matter will just be bored and they won't get anything out of your talk at all. And the, the ones that, are, that haven't heard as much won't be pulled up nearly as far. So, so teach up, teach up towards that upper quarter of your, your audience if you can, and you'll drag everybody up with you. Start with a story, which I did, right? So how come stories matter? Not a convinced about the stories? What's that? They make it relatable. They make it relatable. That's right. In fact, actually, stories are one of the most important things that, that humans have. You know, in the stat lab, we talk about human superpowers, right? Pattern recognition, the ability to find the middle of any object. But telling a story is actually another one of our superpowers, right? Like, we can take all kinds of information, and if you arrange it into a narrative, you can create a gigantic, elaborate, fact-filled tale, right? That's the Odyssey. That lasted for, for thousands of years in a non-written form. That's a human superpower. But it's even more than that. You know who that is? That's Plato. He was wrong about just about everything, but he was right about this. He was right about this. So if you want your lessons to stick, you need to give them an emotional base. And a story does that, which is why I told you the tale about my dad just walking out and surprising those lessons. All right, this might be the most important thing. Build out your just one thing from the simple to the complex. So let's take one example of this. Seven levers control oxygen delivery in any patient. So there's a thesis, something I've got to prove, and we want to talk about this in the ICU. So the conventional way is to pop this equation up there and just launch in. Okay. Wait, Hornick, what's your impression of that, by the way? Like, just, wait, that's it. He just went, I don't know, like, just, uh, it's just too much, right? So it's a bunch of symbols and, and this long equation. And even if you're really mathematically sophisticated, it takes you a long time to sort of parse that out and figure out what's going on there. Instead, uh, the speaker would just launch in and everybody's lost right away. Even those, even if you're teaching up for the people that already know this equation, they're not going to get it. So how could you do this differently? Well, well, that's trying to count seven things. <laughs> that's right. Well, oh, that's the other thing is they'll they'll do things like that. So so better just to build it out from just the the base outward. So let's just start with what we're talking about. Oxygen delivery. Oxygen delivery. All right. So wait a minute. What's that little dot on top of that D mean? Anybody know? What's that? It's a differential equation, right? Okay, for extra bonus points, whose <laughs> whose annotation is that? That's Newton. That's right. That's Newton's. So hardly anybody uses this, but the point is, it's a differential equation. If you were going to write it out differently, it would be right. It would be. But but oh my God, no one wants that, and so we just like ignore it. So all right. So, but we know, we know that this is just composed of two parts, right? It's cardiac output, times <coughs> oxygen content, and we know that cardiac output is heart rate times what? Stroke. Times stroke volume. But actually, this isn't the simplest form of this, right? Because stroke volume is is a, the product of two other things. Anyway. Chest compression and diastolic. That's right. Okay. So there they are. But it, oops, wait a minute. It turns out that there's another equation for cardiac output. You can always tell the engineer in the audience, right? <laughs> so, right, and we always forget this one. We're, we were trained in high school, like, oh, well. So, and it turns out there's a parallel equation, and that is that it's perfusion pressure, but we'll just say mean arterial pressure here, divided by systemic vascular resistance. And on the other side, the, the content <laughs> equation is basically the SAT times the hemoglobin plus the, the partial pressure, right? So that means it's the it's the oxygen in the blood plus the oxygen in the water, right? And, and that's all. And then within this, we can start to figure out what our levers are. There they are. 
Now, let's put heart rate in gray because you wouldn't want to manipulate this one. Right? You don't want to jack up the heart rate. Unless it's very, very low, very, very high. But all those things in colors are, some, are things that we can directly manipulate. Right? And then I put some of those in green because those are the classics. Right? So the other name for end diastolic volume, for example. No one? Preload. Afterload. Systemic acid resistance. Contractility. Right? So that preload, afterload, contractility is correct, but it's incomplete. Right? So now you can see that already. And then we could do this with the oxygen saturation. It turns out there's two, just two things that you can figure out there that you can manipulate the FL2 <coughs> and the shunt fraction. And then later we could talk about what changes the shunt because it's really only just a couple things. Right? Um, and then once we had this rubric, I could go on and I could say, well, but actually this looks like a linear differential equation, but it's not a linear equation because it's actually a coupled equation. These are parallel and they're coupled and they're not linear because all these have feedback effects and it becomes really, really complex. And we could build a whole lecture off of that. But now you guys are all oriented. <coughs> To that equation, and it only took just a couple minutes. So that's what I mean by building out. It also gets rid of this idea called the curse of knowledge, right? Like, so because you have prepared, you've become the subject matter expert, and pretty soon you think that you know, and then you think that everybody knows what you know. So now it's just obvious. And so you'll just be talking past all your audience unless you do this kind of thing. All right. Death by PowerPoint. <coughs> so we did all the preparation, but let's talk about how you actually make your slides. Because man, I've seen some bad, bad slides in my career. Bad slides in my life. I want to avoid death by PowerPoint. Let's start with the first thing. You're not done when you're when you can't add anymore. You're done when you can you're taking everything away. It's hard to do <laughs> when you're like, especially when you've got to be very knowledgeable about about the topic, and you've got some really great stuff to put in there. But have you heard this phrase, "Kill your darlings"? Sometimes you just got to cut good stuff. And I had some great things in here about monkeys and fashion and all. It's all gone. I don't have time for it. But there, I'd like to take a moment and talk about some things that you should never put in your talk. <laughs> Have you seen this? There's, where did this come from? Three learning objectives. Have you ever in your life used a learning objective or said, well, I think the speaker really did a fine job with those three learning objectives. <laughs> Maybe not so good on number two. No one does this. No one remembers what they are. And have you seen what the learning objectives are? They're always like some, you know, completely vague, hackneyed thing like, you know, oh, well, understand the relation of the deliverables to all stakeholders in the enterprise. It doesn't even mean anything at all. And so, and, but we're forced to do that. And what's special about three? Nothing. Right? We already knew that talks are about just one thing. And so, so when they ask for this, tell them no or give them one. This thing, the conflict of interest thing. Where did this come from? You know, this idea is, is based on a, a classic logical fallacy, which is called the ad hominem attack, which means it says that if the, if the person has some sort of flaw, then the message must be flawed as well. Now that's, that's been a fallacy since Aristotle. It's just wrong. If you're the audience, you should be skeptical of what anybody says even me, no matter no matter what their conflicts are. Uh, the ACS loves this. They they will give you an approved template. I'll show you an example of this. Don't use the template. You don't have to. And a CME statement, like you know, okay, that's for the announcement. No one reads these. No one cares. Now, what if you're giving a talk? For an organization that just insists on this. Just say no. 
That's right. Don't come. Don't do these things. And if they insist, they insist, they say, well, we won't let you talk, then don't talk. Don't come. Don't forget the value that you add. You're the talent. Well, you are. So you're the subject matter expert. And you, they can't treat you like this. Don't let them. I mean, they can if you let them. So refuse this stuff. This is stupid. This is cognitively wrong. Don't play into this. All this other stuff is logically and illogically wrong. So don't give in. Join the insurrection. Just say no. And all those people that are running conferences you know who you are. Don't you dare teach your, treat your speakers like this. It's rude. Uh, you know, and have no compunction about just going, well, then I can't come. All right. I, I was asked once. <laughs> we all wish we did. No, we do. And even if you did, who cares? Who cares? Who cares? It's just logically irrelevant. All right. Okay. Here's an important rule. Don't waste pixels. Don't waste pixels. Now, you can look up here and you might say, look at all this blank space up here. But that white space has a purpose. Actually, none of it's wasted, right? You're looking at just this message right now. Right there. And I've got this thing up here because I'm trying to keep you oriented to this middle section of my talk. So now you know where we are. We already did prepare, now we're doing PowerPoint. This, don't waste pixels. But I'll tell you, the software just invites you to waste those pixels, man. Look at this. This is the, you know, make a new slideshow. Look at all this stuff. <laughs> old fashioned wood type, this cutie colored stuff. It's like a bathroom. Like, what? <laughs> All those things are crutches intended to cover your lack of content. <laughs> Do not use them. There's only one up here that's right. You see it? There it is. Right here. Right? Oh, and by the way, it's a laser pointer. <laughs> if you've got something to point out, put it up on the screen like this. Right? You don't want to be like the laser pointer guy. You know? <laughs> wave, wave, blah, blah, wave, wave, blah, blah, like that. Like that's, don't do that. If you want to call things out, call them out. All right. Let's find, okay, all right. So he already found, he already found one of the, one of the mistakes here. Right? God, I see this all the time. Sorry, my this is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening here? <coughs> Didn't lock the aspect ratio, right? Right. So, so they went to go adjust the picture, just scaled it, and like didn't occur to you that you could actually, you know, that the horizontal and vertical scaling are different. There's a bunch of other mistakes on here, right? We've got, well, you see any? Barely read the title. Barely read the title. What else? <laughs> okay, so Hornick's looking at it like that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen, <laughs> right? It's ugly. Like this is just cute. It serves your needs because you're like, look how cute I am. I put like a cute background on. <laughs> Stupid, right? So the logos, the logos, the logos. Ridiculous. Okay. Get rid of the logos. Get rid of the logos. He's right. So, but logos. all the time we see this meme about putting the logos in, right? You're gonna signal your like group identity or whatever or worse you're it's at some you're at some conference and they want you to like use their little template to put their logo on there screw that don't do that you're the talent you're not there to advertise their conference you're there to fill their conference so you don't have to advertise that plus it takes up a huge amount of real estate this is your space not theirs don't give them that the picture there's actually a million mistakes on here right so the background's ridiculous the default font, and I just say, I hate Calibri more than anything else. <laughs> Why is that? Because Microsoft, it's a perfectly pretty font, but Microsoft defaults that to everything. And if you're using the defaults because you're too lazy to do something else, whose needs are you serving? Your own. Show me someone that's using nothing but Calibri on anything they write, and I'll show you someone that didn't really care. 
It's not the aesthetics of it. It's the, did you think about it? Right? The wasted logos, the poor aspect ratio, the contrast. So let's talk about what we could do differently. First of all, never use words when you can use images. In fact, that whole rule about, you know, well, what you should do is seven bullet points per slide, and every slide, every bullet point should have about seven words. Well, that was made up from some, you know, very old 70s psychological research about what people could remember. But for heaven's sakes, you're going to give a talk like this, <clears throat> just packed with slides like this. All right, wait a minute. Whose needs does a, does a slide like this serve? It serves your own. Why? Because you're using this as a prompt because you don't know your subject. Right? You don't know it. So you're like, oh, I'm going to put it up there so I just know it. And then you read it because you're nervous about speaking. So I'd just rather read it. But then it turns out that, that this has been studied. And then if you are reading out loud a slide and the audience is also looking at it and reading it, <laughs> it's the worst retention. You could either you could either have given a talk, like just just read like to a blank slide, or let them read something, and either of those would have been better in terms of retention. Here, they don't hear you speaking, and they don't see really what's on the slide, so you don't serve the audience at all. You haven't leveraged any of the kind of human brain power. This is just terrible. Don't do this. And then like this nesting of of, of bullet points, like a single nest. Of, with a single nest, it's also stupid. <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense. Careless use of fonts, uh, right? Like, you should probably never use Comic Sans or any of these other cute fonts. <laughs> cute fonts sort of serve your own needs mostly, unless they're really aimed at, at clarity or they have a real message, right? Like, so you probably saw I used some comic book fonts here, and that's there's a whole science of comic books in terms of telling stories, but I'll come to that later. All right, here's something you could do better. We start with an image. This is a specific geometric shape. Anybody know the name of this shape? It, indeed, it does. Indeed, it does. So this is a is a fractal, right? It's a specific geometric shape. This was a discovery by Benoit Mandelbrot. It was like revolutionized our idea of of geometry and biology. <laughs> the idea is that you just iterate a basic shape over and over again. And you can vary things randomly like these lengths and these angles. And you just repeat it and bolt it on, and repeat it and bolt it on, and repeat it and bolt it on. And it turns out that this fractal is the most important geometric shape in nature. Fractal means fractional dimension. It's an iterated and scaled unit. It's designed to reach every point in that volume, just like the long vasculature does. But it does that in a particular way. It does this in the most parsimonious way there is. So it minimizes the amount of material, like the actual amount of pipe, and the amount of energy it takes to actually push the substrate, whether that's air or blood, to every one of those points. <coughs> and it even minimizes the information that's required, the algorithm that's required to, to create that. Right, so it may be that like development of the lung takes as few as three genes interacting with each other. That's a very parsimonious computation. And nature does this anywhere that it needs to solve a distribution problem, right? Whether you're trying to go from a single place and, just, and send it out to everything, right? Like if you're trying to perfuse the liver, this could easily be the liver bed or a tumor aspirature, for example. Or if you're trying to do many to one, like a tree is trying to harvest all this light, maximize the surface area. So this, these distribution problems are ubiquitous in nature. And nature solves this all the time, even if it's not a biological thing, right? So it'll do it in a delta or a riverbed or uh, a mycelium, anything. So, so that's what I mean by use use your pictures. And then I just gave you a little argument, and then I gave you a little bullet down here that's going to be the, our next thing, which is mathematically this turns into, into some things that you can't get around that will apply to your practice. Hopefully you're interested in that. Maybe we'll give that talk some other time. But my point is, I could have done this all with like bullet points, but mostly you were staring at this. And as I was talking, you 
can see the truth of it. It reaches every point in the in the in the sphere. And here's another weird thing: the dimension of this isn't two dimensions, and it's not three dimensions. It's partial. It's like two point four. It's a really weird thing. So that's what fractal means: fractional dimension. And so, so now you're curious. You're having an emotional response. You're going to remember that. Nobody's going to forget fractals, but we're going to move on anyway because this is a fractal talk. It's a big math problem. Oh. Yeah. So, all right. Another talk, another day. That's right. Let's talk about your graphs because most of your talks should be about graphs, right? And certainly it's true that graphs are just god awful for the most part, right? Ever since the invention of PowerPoint, you would get like tiny graphs that were like 3D something, just terrible. The default thing. This is the worst thing you can ever use. If you never, ever, ever made a pie chart again. That'd be just fine. There's no, there's no reason to use a pie chart ever. This is, this doesn't show it. Yeah, I really worry about South Africa. They're in big trouble, <laughs> they're in trouble <laughs> right? And just because you can make a 3D graph doesn't mean you should. What does this mean? No idea, right? But and you can't rescue it by making it cute, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, this is like, uh, see how clever I am? I uh, put the bananas in it. It's ridiculous. Don't do that. And it's unreadable. All right, so if you have data like this and you want to show it, there's another way to do it. And it's, it's a grid of graphs, right? So you could show the same scale over and over and over again with just the different, <coughs> different things. And that lets your audience, that lets your audience make all those comparisons really on the fly according to the same scale. You can <coughs> cheat and change the, the y-axis, for example. But you can you can just iterate these over and over again. And uh, it's certainly better than than the usual practice of just one damn thing after another, which is how Edgar Tufts describes it. That was PowerPoint. Uh, Excel will just lead you down the path of foolishness. Right? You'll have some sort of data, and it'll invite you to do something like this. Right? So what's wrong with this graph? <laughs> All right, so yep, the axis isn't labeled. Exactly. Why are these pyramids? Because it's cool. It's not cool, it's stupid, right? And you can't even tell anything. Also, wait, what order do these go in? And do these colors correspond to anything? Yes, Dr. Nancy, have something to add? Micro lights the pyramids. And the color. <laughs> <laughs> if it looks pretty, it's not good enough. So, so you don't want to do a graph like this. You want your graphs. You don't ever want to do chartoons. You want to do graphs like this, right? So uh, a Pareto graph shows both scale and rank, and you can see instantly what's going on. And you should also annotate your graphs, right? Like so, so you shouldn't just show them. Like you can show a graph, and you should probably show just one because each graph has an idea. But you also want to actually say right on your slide what the graph means. So these are results of the American Board of Surgery certifying exam, the oral boards for general surgery. And what we can see is that failure rates were declining <clears throat> until the ACGME came in and gave some clever ideas. Uh, that, that's a powerful indictment of work hour restrictions and competency-based methods. And that's all this slide shows. <gasps> yes. <laughs> all right, so that's great. Let's talk about images a little bit. <laughs> don't do this with your images. Don't jumble them up. Don't show them all like this. You probably want to, if you have a point, put one image on here. But this could be improved, right? How? Well, I could use my pixels. Now you can see it. And I got rid of the contrast. Now you can really see it. It's an x-ray, right? But I could do even better, right? I could annotate. 
I could wiggle my laser pointer at it, but I'd rather do this. And you can not only annotate, but you can actually show it, and then you can take it away. So that now the audience has drawn their eye to it, and they see it without your notes on there. And then you can bring other things into the room. That's not a fracture. But those other ones are. Line shift, etc. Right? You can do this. So you can draw the audience to your, your image and show them really what it means. Because you already know your image, but they're just seeing it for the first time. You've got the curse of knowledge. They don't know. So you need to guide them through. Here's another example, right? I made the same mistake. Tiny little picture on all this real estate and also Calibri. All right, so, <laughs> so we could do better, right? We could put it, we could make it big and we can annotate the structures, but we could do even better. We could orient, we could orient the audience and say, okay, this is the view that you have, right? So these little insets, now we all know the head's up there, the feet are there, and you're looking towards the spine. Easy. That doesn't take that long, and it radically improves the quality of the images. All right, we've got just a few minutes left. Let's talk about just presentation in general. Man, you gotta calm your nerves. This is the scariest thing you can do, but it's not that scary if you if you prepare. So Here's something that'll make you make you happy. Just come early and check all your stuff, right? Make sure that you, well, present off your own laptop if you can, right? Because if you used you know a special font or you've got your <coughs> graphics or heaven forbid you put a movie in there, it never makes it up there. And you're like, oh, I don't know if this is working, you know? Okay, so, but if you have it from your own laptop, you will bring your own little dongles like those connectors because very often they won't have them. Plug it in and make sure it runs. Like it only takes a few minutes, but it avoids all kinds of stuff. And also that gives you time to center what you're gonna say. You can think about it a little bit beforehand and you can get focused on, on your talk. And just take a breath, right? You're well prepared. You're the subject matter expert. If you're not, why are you here, right? But you are, you're ready, so you can go. speak publicly. We have a tendency to use these tricks that they told us before, which is like, focus on a point out, you know, beyond the audience, so it sort of looks like you're talking about them. Or, you know, stare at the clock, or worse, you know, imagine everybody naked, like they calm your nerves. No, that's not right. If you're giving a talk, it's just a conversation. You're just having a conversation with people. Right? That's right. Sorry to put the spotlight on you. Well, so, but see what you can do. If you are out in front, you're here, and you're talking to different parts of the audience, you can see if people are with you. They'll nod, they'll smile, they'll laugh at your jokes, hopefully. Be careful with jokes. <laughs> right? So, you're with them. So, rather than just like, you're there reading your reading your text, the TGF beta activates the TTBA cascade. Like no one cares about that. That's not a conversation. That's speaking at people. Never do that. It's just a conversation. I've been talking to a bunch of you here. And if you're really nervous, just pick a friend in the audience. Even a big audience, you can do this. You can find one person that you can just sort of speak with and just keep coming back to them. It will change everything. It'll change your tone and your tempo. And you can see that I'm given a bunch of pauses. Why? Because sometimes I want you to think about what I just said and let it soak in for a second. Let your words breathe a little. When you get to the end of your talk, you want to leave them with action steps. Right, things that they can actually do. Right, which usually means that your last slide needs to be, or close to your last slide, needs to be just a summary slide. Do you have to give people your PowerPoint? Do I have your PowerPoint? <laughs> Absolutely not. You have no obligation to give your PowerPoint to anyone. 
it took a long time to assemble that content. And someone's going to take it and use it or whatever. Or maybe they say, oh, I'm going to take it and I'm going to read it. And they're not going to read your PowerPoint. No one cares. If you really want to give them something, like say, let's say that you're truly a subject matter expert and you wanted to give them something, send them your paper that was about the same thing then that will serve their needs better. But you don't have to give them that. But sometimes you want to have like a, a last slide that, has, that, that summarizes everything. And that's okay to do. There's some things that are not okay to do. There's some really bad endings. You don't want to have bad endings. One is like the, the lengthy acknowledgments, right? Uh, I would really like to thank my family, and you know, they're really supportive of me, and you know, and all these people in my lab that you've never heard of, and they really worked super hard. And you're going, people are going on and on about that, and it's so nice and polite, but your audience doesn't care. They don't. They've already tuned out. You're tuning me out right now. You don't care. You don't have to do acknowledgments. It's polite, but it's not needed. It doesn't serve the audience. It serves you. Look how polite I am. No. Serve your audience. The fawning gratitude. Right? Oh my gosh, you guys are the greatest audience ever. I've never had an audience just like you. I mean, you've seen people do this, right? You're like, ugh, you don't believe it. It just seems disingenuous. Don't do that. <sighs> this is not the time to ask for money. <laughs> I mean, I'll take it. <laughs> but, the, but don't ask that, right? Solicitations for funding are always, should always be right, a flanking maneuver. Put it out there, demonstrate your value. Later, someone else says, would you like to support this? Some other venue, not here. Apologies again, right? Shakespeare used to do this, like he would, you know, he, but he was sort of doing it tongue in cheek, right? There was always an apology at the end. There'd be some character, like at the end of Romeo and Juliet, and then it'd be some sort of like, you know, like this, put your hands together, if not, you know, pound sand, whatever. The, uh, but don't do this, right? Nobody wants to hear your apology. Again, if you weren't ready, get off the stage. And the, God, the worst of all, oh. thank you so much for coming on this journey with me. <laughs> I really wanted to start a conversation here. I'm like, no, what are you talking about? I'm not starting a conversation. What does this even mean? Uh, don't do that. No one wants these sort of hacky, you know. Like it, it, the equivalent to this in papers is like, like, well, we're still unsure, but what we really need is a randomized controlled trial. That'll never happen, <laughs> right? Don't put that in your papers either. Don't do this kind of thing in your talk. All right. Finally, watch the clock and finish early, right? <clears throat> Give them your action steps. So, that's the talk talk. Do you guys have any questions for me? Hmm. I'll send this out if you're <laughs> 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 Just the one slide, though. <laughs> All right, then we're done about five minutes early. Thank you very much. Oh my God. Thank <laughs> you.